Welcome to Chamber Talk. My name is Andrew Gregson, and today I have a very special guest today, uh, retired Senator Dick Ackerman. Thank you very much for coming on today, today, Thank Dick. You, um, you've done many things in your life, been state, state Senate, been a mayor of the city, been on the council, been on dozens and, and dozens of uh, different committees and boards and things like that. But one of the most important things to me today is not only you're a fellow Rotarian, but you're also uh, a past president of the chamber. You were a past president in 78, was it, I believe? Somewhere around Somewhere there. Around <laughs> that. Um, now, uh, I know that, you know, uh, some of the things you've done have been extremely impressive, and that was how you started off your career. So do you mind sharing a little bit about how you first joined the chamber? What made you first become a member? Okay, well, I, I had a law practice in Fullerton. I joined a pra existing practice in Fullerton, and I did mainly business law. So mm. all my clients were business people. A lot of them were in Fullerton. A lot of them were involved in the chamber. And I think somebody said, why don't you get involved in the chamber? And I said, I will. So I, I did it. Uh, they had a very active people there. I think I indicated at the time a lot of the, a lot of, there are a lot of very large companies in Fullerton, Hunt Wesson, uh, Beckman, uh, Hughes Aircraft, Kimberly Clark is the other one. I knew it would come back to me. Uh, so we had a lot of big business, we had a very uh, medium sized, small business, but they were all very active. Uh, so I joined the board, good, good bunch of people. Uh, they were very active. They had retreats. I think one of the big things, they had a retreat in Lake Tahoe because somebody, one of the members wow. had a couple of condos up there. So huh? we went up there for retreats. That's nice. Uh, but they were very active in, in local politics uh, and very active in working with the city. And, you know, if they had issues with the city, they would uh, bring it up with them. So I got involved in the chamber, and I just... Some, I th think the opportunity came to run for office, so I ran for president one time, and I was elected. Right. Uh, and it was a great, great time. Very active group and very important in the local community. And then what made you or what inspired you to go from a member to be on the board to then become president? What what got you that step? What made you? Uh, probably some friends suggested it. I probably wouldn't <laughs> have thought of it myself. Uh, but I wanted to be more active in the decision-making process. Mm. I could say the chamber was... Very active, and I, I think I can't tell how many members. I'm guessing, I'd say 600 or 700 members. I maybe sounds wrong. about right but if they, I look at the records. Yeah, yeah, but they had a lot of members, and they were very active, and they did stuff. And I like to be involved with people that are coming up with solutions, trying to make Fullerton a better place to live and and do business in. And I really like the fact they also had good relationships with all the colleges. They had Fullerton College here, Cal State Fullerton. I think I'm not sure when Hope University came. Uh, but they had a lot of institutional things plus all the business, so it really had a, a lot of things going for them. And then what what inspired you then? Sat at work, doing your attorney stuff, <laughs> working in the chamber, working in the community, and then suddenly you thought, oh, you know, I'll run for city council. What happened there? Well, at that, at that point in time, uh, our opinion was that the uh, council was sort of anti-business, and they had mm. a big debut, uh, debate on the sign ordinance. They wanted to be much more restrictive. And signage is very important to businesses yeah. even now. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> we decided we we're going to run some people for city council, and we formed a PAC, which is very unusual back in the mid '70s because wow. PACs, PACs weren't popular back then. Uh, so we ran ran a couple of people, got got two of them elected. We got ready for the next election cycle, and they were hurting for candidates. So they said, "Why don't you run?" And I really hadn't thought of it, and I said, "Okay, I'll try it." Uh, so I did it. My campaign committee was mainly a lot of the people from the chamber. Uh, so we ran a campaign. I got elected. I was the number one vote getter, and I was able to get elected a couple times after that. Uh, but I decided it was it's nice being wanting to influence uh, the decision makers. It's also nice to cast a vote. So I said, "Well, I'm going to give it a shot," and I ran and I got elected. So then, if you don't if you don't mind sharing, Dick, what because this is very important to me. Um, after being so involved in the community on the on the side of the chamber and then going on to the council, how do you see the chamber in its operational in the business world when you're sat on the council chair? Uh, well, I, was, I don't know if I mentioned it. Before I got there, the, the city was actually subsidizing the chamber, I think twenty or 25000 a year. Mm. And when I got on the city council, I decided to eliminate that, which got a lot of people upset. Mm. But I thought it was better for the, for the 
uh, chamber to be independent, so we didn't have to. I wanted to hear their opinion. I didn't want to feel that they owed us anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did that, uh, and I think we were able to develop a very good business climate in Fullerton. In fact, at one point, I think we recall, we got written up in the register as being Blood Alley because uh, we had four or five of the major discount stores like Fedco and before it was Costco. We had, I think, five of them along here because we had a very good, we still have a good location off of uh, 91 Freeway mm -hmm. and 5, plus having Beckman and Hughes and, and uh, Hunt Wesson and Kimberly Clark. Uh, we had a very, very large and active business community. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it was very important to establish a good business record. And I think we set, <coughs> we raised our sales tax revenue. Uh, about the only thing a city can control revenue-wise is sales tax. The rest mm -hmm. of it, you're all dependent on uh, county and state taxes. So we were able to increase our sales tax a lot uh, during the time I was on the council with, long, with the other council people's help because they all saw it was an income stream. You need money if you want to do something in the city. Uh, so we created a good business climate, and it paid off. Now, I'm glad you just touched on that point because I think it's something that a lot of people don't realize is, uh, you know, yes, we all pay taxes, but very little of that sales tax actually goes to the city, doesn't it? There's a very small amount, right? Yes, yeah, like one, one cent. When it, when it used to be six cents, we got one, one penny out of each. I'm not sure what it is now, but it's... A small part. Every the rest of it, we really can't control. You're dependent on how much money you get. You get a portion of the property tax. The rest of it all comes from the state and other other forms of taxes. <clears throat> the big big portion of it is sales tax, but you you don't, you only get a small portion of that. And knowing this, like understanding that you know, because it's so easy to think, oh, the city gets all my taxes. When really, like you yeah, said, it's don't. like one percent. Yeah. And obviously, you still have a budget of running the city, because it's like a big service center, isn't it, a city? Mm -hmm. It gives services out everywhere. Um, what types of um, challenges do you face on city council to make this happen, especially if people are like, no, I'm not putting up my taxes. What, what, what happens? Well, well, I think one, one thing we did was set priorities. Uh, you know, the biggest portion of the city budget is police and fire. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> that, that kind of protection is important to everybody. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's being debated now is a lot of cities are cutting back on police, which I think is not good. Uh, they generally don't cut back on fire, although the, their fire uh, budgets have been cut back, and that's why you see a lot of cities consolidating or going with the county yeah. uh, to try and save money. But I think public safety is the most important uh, most important thing, but you have to, to fund all that stuff or to help fund it, you need a, need, need a big business climate. And the main reason I got involved in the chamber and in the city and even the state was my business background. If you don't have a good business climate locally or statewide or nationally, you're not going to have any income. You know, right. people, you have to have jobs. The jobs uh, come from the businesses. And I get a kick when people sort of criticizing the rich people or the businesses. If you don't have rich people in the businesses, you're not going to have any jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need those people to encourage them to invest in businesses because that's where everybody gets their job. And that's where I got clients was out of, out of businesses. So business is very important in the big picture. And sometimes uh, some of our colleagues don't, don't understand that. That's good. That's good. That's, um, I'm glad you mentioned all that uh, information there because I feel a lot of us, we don't know. You know, it's it's one of those things is uh, I remember when I first came on board here, there was a lot of talk about the roads and how bad they are in full yeah. turn <clears throat> and so on and forth. So uh, however, the the city's challenge is it doesn't have the money to to fix all that stuff. And so when they proposed some time ago about putting up taxes, I believe it was a it was a hard you weren't there then, of course. Well, you were here, but yeah, you, weren't, you, weren't, you weren't in that job, yeah. right? It was your yeah. responsibility. Um, so it sort of like knuckled. And I feel that over time, uh, a lot of that is probably because everybody wasn't well informed as to, to do that. Yeah, I think one, one of the problems that Fullerton had, even when I was here, is an old city. It's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And old cities have old roads, old water mains. I remember the discussion about water. Water is still a problem in Fullerton. You can't replace all of them. It just costs too much. And so generally you just sort of wait till something breaks and then you fix it. Uh, but the roads, the roads have become, I think, a little worse than they were now. And I think the council, in addition to public safety, <clears throat> transportation obviously is a very important one. If people 
I hear more complaints of friends of mine that have to go through Fullerton. If the roads are too bad, they're not going to go to the businesses. So you got to you got to have a good business climate. You have to have a, an ability for people to get to the businesses without getting their car wrecked. And you want to also have police and fire protection. So if something goes wrong, you're going to get some attention. Now, you know, a lot of this comes from, you know, when, when you try and fix things, a lot of things come from experience. If you were to, you know, quickly sum it up, what type of maybe advice or experience would you share with any city that has these situations on how to maybe overcome these challenges? I think you got to prioritize things to begin with. And a lot of cities don't. They want to try and do everything. And you can't, you can't do everything. There's just not enough money. <clears throat> and then you have to have, I think, law enforcement is very important. I think a lot of the homeless problem we've had is that we haven't enforced laws that we've had quick enough. And sometimes it gets to a thing where you go over past the tipping point. We may have gone past the tipping point in homeless in, in California because we've let it exist for too long. Mm. Uh, you know, some of the law changes, you know, people get arrested now and they don't even go to jail. They, they get booked in and they get put back right on the street. Uh, so part of that is state law. Part of it's local enforcement. Uh, generally, Orange County has been pretty good on enforcing laws. So I think we have less of a problem both in homeless and crime than in L.A. County. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of it is controlled by the city. You know, mm -hmm. you have to, again, you have to make priorities. Are you going to put your money in things like that? Or are you going to put your money in some pie-in-the-sky thing or some more things that might feel good, but they don't, they don't protect your citizens? Now, do you feel, because home, the homeless topic is, is a huge, yeah. <laughs> it is, woof, yeah. it's over there. Everybody yeah. I speak to in work, uh, obviously that's one of their top things. And there's no, like, magic thing. Personally, I think it's, it's not just a local thing. It's, 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 yes. a, it's a global thing, yeah. really. Um, what types of things do you think you may be looking at if you were um, still uh, in the Senate to, to maybe push to help these things? You said laws. I mean, is that the answer? Is it, is it more to, to do with um, really looking at the problem and seeing how we can help house the homeless? Or is that the answer? What, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, there's no there's no silver bullet, but one, no. of, one of the things we used to have mental hospitals in California, <clears throat> and they were eliminated, I think, in the 80s, mm. and probably a third to a half of the homeless people have some kind of mental problem, mm. and you can't put them in jail because the cops they, they don't know how to treat those people, sure, and they probably need to be in hospitals, right, at least for a period of time. But now you can't do that because uh, of all the laws saying you can't do it. Uh, the other thing is housing costs. It costs much more to build a house in California than it does in any other state. Right. Part of that's attributable to a nice place to live, but part of it's all the government regulation. Right. I forget what the cost was. If you were going to build a new house in Fullerton, I think the amount that goes to fees alone is like 50 or 60 grand, mm. probably more than that now, just before you even, before you build, put a piece of two by four up. Yeah, I think it's about that for the ADUs yeah, right now, yeah. yeah. So. So there's things that can be done, but I think the homeless, I think you need to do something with the mentally ill. We have to crack down on the drug issue. You know, in San Francisco, they're still giving people needles. Mm. And I think somebody in some other area said, you can't give them needles. You can't encourage that. Uh, there's a good, uh, <clears throat> a good example of how to cure homeless in San Antonio, Texas, called the, Ho the Haven for Hope. Uh, they had a big problem in the city because they got a very tourist-type city. It's right on the river. Uh, so they created one area, and it was actually done through the chambers of business people as opposed to government, where if you get arrested for being homeless, the cop says, you will either take you to jail or you go to the Haven for Hope. If you go there, you have to give up all drugs, all this stuff. you got to be clean. They give them a place to sleep, something to eat. They give them treatment. You get, You can get... You know, training, job training, you can do everything there, but it forces the person on the beginning end, you got to give up the drugs, no mm. drugs, and, you know, you got to by, play by the rules. Oh, so like it's a big rehabilitation sensitive thing, isn't it? It is, thing, that's what it, it wow, is. Wow. And it's been, you know, it's not been as successful as they'd like, but it has cleaned up the problem. Uh, and I think that kind of model, you have to be, there, there's always a discussion of whether or not you want to be tough love or mm. soft love. And I think, unfortunately, you got to be tough love. Uh, and a lot of our other elected officials don't want to do that. They think that's mean to the to the homeless people. Right. But you got to you have rules. You got to draw lines. 
And I think it's it, right now, like I say, it's not past the point of no return, but it's probably close to it. Uh, but you need you need law enforcement, mental hospitals, cheaper housing, and rules. Talking about cheaper housing, that's a that's a that's a big another <laughs> that's another huge one. So I'm, I'm, you're bringing up all my topics. This is awesome. <laughs> I love it. Um, so cheaper housing, you know, um, that's that's. It's very easy to say cheap housing, but nothing's cheap, is nothing's it? Cheap, so, yeah. and, and then nothing's cheap if you can't afford it. So, you know, um, what, what do you think some of the answers for that is? Is, you know, me, myself, to give you an example of what I'm looking for maybe is you look at these cities now and everybody's like building within, which is very expensive. It's in the city. Whereas like if you look at the rest of the world, people sort of live outside of the city and travel in, so, which is then less expensive because plus there's more land, right? Yeah. What, what are your takes on, on, on this type of housing or, or what's going on right now? Well, part of it, we've got too much regulation and too many fees. <clears throat> so that's a big part. If they, if you reduce those, I mean, you're going to have to make up taxes some other, some other some way. Other way but, right? but a lot of it's putting on houses, and people, when people buy a house, they don't think they're paying taxes, but you're paying a, a, whole, a whole lot of taxes. The other thing is it's just sort of natural involvement. It used to be the population center in Southern California was L.A., Mm -hmm. Nobody lived in Orange County. L.A. prices got higher, so people moved to Orange Down. County because mm -hmm. it was cheap. Orange County prices are now getting higher, so people are moving to the Inland Empire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their prices are starting to go, and people may move out. So a lot of it's just natural progression. But then all the jobs are in L.A. and Orange County, so then you get people driving back and forth. Uh, so it's not it's not an easy issue, but part of it is done just by people moving to suburbs because that's what historically has happened in Southern California. Uh, so, you know, you're not, you're not going to get cheap housing in Orange County or L.A. because our land values are high, but you can do something with the regulation uh, and, you know, just the controls we have on it. And, uh, you know, the property taxes are probably okay because we have Prop 13, but every time a new person comes in, that thing bounces oh, yeah, up. Right, right. So they're playing a whole lot in taxes. Uh, so part of part of it's just natural. I think not everybody is going to be able to live in Southern California. We're going to reach our max, and that's it. You know, to say I want everybody to live here is not practical. When you try to do infill and go up in a city, mm -hmm. it's very very expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's not not cheap. So. And then that no, causes people, other problems, doesn't it? Because no, now people right. traveling into work, yeah. I'm not going to touch on this subject, but then, you know, if we're all going to go electrical, you're not going to be able to get to work because <laughs> yeah, your charge isn't going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, good luck with that one. If you but, saw, saw the news this morning, and they had these people, I don't know, in New York, where they're having the storm with their Teslas. Most half of them aren't working because test batteries can't work in that cold of weather. No. The other half, they finally got to the charging machine. The charging machine may not work, or you got to wait two hours because it takes twice as long to charge it. Yes, it does. And a bunch of other people were having their Teslas towed to the charging station. And I said, you know, electric cars may be good someday, <clears throat> but not now. You, you can get away with a little bit around here. But if you're in areas that are going to get super hot or super cold, electric cars don't work. No, they're not. And we're not, we're not there yet. We, no. may, we, we may have an alternate. Well, I'm sure we'll have an alternate fuel sure. sometime. Uh, but that's, you know. That's a different issue. Yeah, no, no, it totally is, and it, but it it's another one of those things that we're facing right yeah, now. You yeah. know, it's 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 and hard. All, all the money we're spending for charging stations, you know, all, oh, that, no. all that goes into the price of everything else. Well, you know, if we if it was honest talk, it would be almost like, so we're spending all this money on saving the environment, yeah. <clears throat> but we can't spend any money and fix homeless. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's almost like where's it where's it going to? Isn't true. it really? You know. Um, I saw a thing on, uh, I, I don't know if it's real or not, but I saw something the other day where uh, people who were having problems charging, they have now mobile chargers come out. So it's somebody in a gas or diesel vehicle. Generator, right. <laughs> yeah, it's a gas generator. generator. That's and right. they charge your car. Yep. And I just thought, oh, well, that's, that you know, hey, yeah. start business, why not, right? And so when you became... Obviously, then you were mayor. Was there anything in particular you remember that you you feel was a we'd we'd recognize today in Fullerton as of something that you'd, you'd changed or was a part of? Well, the main main thing was <clears throat> making it very friendly to business. We had a lot of car dealers. Car dealers are very good for the city because of the sales tax. Right. <clears throat> Probably the biggest thing you'd see if you drove around Fullerton is the sports complex at Cal State Fullerton. Yeah. Uh, we put together a deal to build the football stadium, the baseball stadium, softball stadium, 
and tennis and the soccer fields in exchange for Cal State Fullerton let us, letting us use their fields. Uh, adult sports and youth sports are very big all over, and they were very big in Fullerton. Fullerton didn't have enough field space, so we needed grass. Uh, so we made a deal with Cal State Fullerton that when they weren't using the fields, we could use them for free. That's amazing. City of Fullerton. And with that lasted for a, a long time, but probably building the football stadium, uh, the baseball stadium, and uh, the tennis court, softball stadium was probably the biggest thing if you'd see, because that was a very big project, took a lot of work, cooperation you know, with the city, with the chamber, with the university, uh, and all the interest groups, because people were all worried about having a football, st- of course, football of stadium course, in their were, backyard. Right, right. So one of the one thing I did, I formed a citizens group, all the HOAs and the people that lived around Cal State Fullerton. I put them on a committee, said, okay, you guys are going to be involved in the design, you know, where the lights are going to go and all this stuff. And everything worked out pretty well. They they dropped football after we <laughs> we built the football stadium, but that's life. But it's still got a lot of use from... Uh, modern day played there for a while. Servite, <clears throat> the soccer teams all play there, and they mm-hmm. still have uh, they still have two men and women's soccer still very successful there. Uh, so this getting a lot of use, even though we didn't have a football team. That's amazing, and, and those are things we do still see today. So those yeah. are huge, impactful things within the city. Well, good job, man. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Well <laughs> done. So moving uh, along a little bit, what then inspired you to go for Senate? Uh, I always thought about running for state office or federal office, but my kids are all small. Mm. And while a lot of people ran when their kids were little, I said, I'm going to stay here because I want to make sure the kids get through school. I had a couple opportunities to run for assembly, <clears throat> but I, and I actually thought about flying back and forth to Sacramento every day, which you can do, uh, but it would kill you. I talked to one guy that tried it for a while, and he said, you just can't do it. You can't be active and stuff, so I passed on it. <clears throat> my wife said, well, you may not get another chance. And I said, I don't care. The kids kids are more important. So I did have another chance because Ross Johnson, who was the assemblyman, decided to run for Senate. Uh, so I left an open assembly seat, a special election. So I said, I think, <clears throat> I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> and again, the same, same group, my same campaign committee was basically a lot of people from Fullerton Chamber. <clears throat> Cause so we raised the money. We ran in a special election. We got elected. And uh, it was sort of interesting because one of my kids was getting married in Hawaii at the time and I said well you got to go you got to go to the wedding so back then they didn't have iPhones they had fax machines so we were faxing stuff back and forth and I said well, we can do this I got a campaign group they can do it and they I remember they were sending me copies of some of the hit pieces that people were doing they always do hit pieces in elections that's part of the drill and I tried to hide them from my wife and the family because they, they they didn't want to see that stuff so I did anyway so I ran ran for assembly got elected. You asked, why did, why did I decide to do it? I said, well, it's probably the same reason I went on the city council. I said, it's it's okay to be an influencer of votes, but it's also nice to be the person that cast the vote. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know, I think I'm going to try and do that. So I did it, did that for five years because I was in mid, mid-election, mid and then it just happened to coincide uh, with the Senate seat. The senator was termed out, so I ran for the Senate seat, did that for eight years. I was four years. I was a Senate leader which is probably the hardest job because uh, you see what happens to all the leaderships, the speakers in D.C. or all that. When you're when you're the leader, you have to make a lot of people happy, and you can't because everybody, no. everybody, everybody has different opinions. Right. Uh, but that was probably the hardest four years of my life, just doing that because you're also responsible for elections. You had target members, so you had to raise raise money and you know select candidates and get people to run all throughout the state. Right. But it was very enjoyable, had a good time. Uh, the other thing that was nice when our kids were gone, my wife could come up uh, with me. She came up probably three weeks out of four, and we actually had a little house up there for a while. <clears throat> so she did; she could do her work, you know, there. And then we had a lot of friends in uh, in Sacramento, and my wife actually did. She was actually my fundraiser too. Oh wow! And see that I, works out, I, doesn't it? I, working I, with your spouse, yeah, I, that's when such I important. Ran, when I ran. Before, the first time, I ran at an odd time, and I couldn't get any of the professional fundraisers. So my wife, Linda, said, well, I'll do it for you, because she had raised money. She had worked in the chamber in uh, Yorba Linda. She'd worked in Assistance League and a bunch of other things, and all you do in those is raise money. Right. So she said, I'll do it. So she did it, and she did a good job, which is really good, because all the lobbyists knew her as well as they knew me. So when we went to functions, Linda had always come along, 
And, you know, she got more attention than I did because she was better looking. But they liked to talk to her <laughs> as opposed to me. Uh, we, had a, we had a good time, and it was interesting. A lot of the events in, back then in Sacramento were members only. You couldn't, nobody brought spouses. And I said, that's sort of goofy. So I said, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go unless I can bring Linda. So they said, okay. So they changed the rule, wow. and, and they started allowing spouses, which is good. I mean, most of those events, you, you don't want to go and leave your spouse at home. Right. Uh, so we had a lot of good good time there. Went on a lot of a lot of trips. They had a lot of trade mission type trips. So we went to China, Australia, Europe, uh, all over the place, South America. It was very educational because it was very useful. And Linda, of course, went on, went on all of them. She got to go shopping. I had to go to meetings. Uh, but it was a fun fun time, very enjoyable. And I said I don't know if I'd want to do it now. It's a little more toxic now. Right. You know, everybody. People got along there. Uh, I got along very well with the Democrat Democrat leaders, uh, and there, you know, there was much more cordiality back then, mm -hmm. and people worked together. And uh, I was the leader of the Senate was probably the most one of the more liberal guys up there, but we were good buddies. And everybody said, "How can you get along with him?" And I said, "Because his word is good, and he'll negotiate with you on a deal, and and you know, you try and get things done." So right. it was a fun time. Looking back, because obviously you're all, we're always wise after the fact, aren't we? Yeah. Um, looking back, are there things that you think, because uh, it sounds like you shaped quite a lot of different things in your life so far. Um, is, there, is there an area where you think, well, if, uh, if, if, if we were a part of this, this could have happened, or is there, I suppose, regrets? Is there anything you think of back now that you might have changed differently? Uh, probably not. <clears throat> the Republicans we were already in the minority. I got to serve with three governors, with Governor Wilson, Governor Davis, and Governor Schwarzenegger. Oh, wow. So that that was interesting. It was, you're always in a much better spot if you had a Republican governor, because even if you're in the minority, uh, the Republican governor would help you. So that made you more effective. Uh, now we're probably not going to have a Republican governor for a long time because the Democrats outnumber us. Uh, but I think just I think term limits was part of it. I, I used to think term limits was good, and now I think it's bad because uh, there was a lot of turnover uh, in all all the legislation, not not the federal mm -hmm. levels, locally, and you lost a lot of the a lot of the friend friendships that you developed. Uh, too many of the people now that are getting elected, especially at state office, I think are too young. They don't have any life experience. Uh, a lot of them are former staffers. And they haven't really lived life, so they really don't know what's going on. And they don't, they're don't they looking more at their next office as opposed to doing something now. Right. The class I came with, both the Republicans and Democrats, all wanted to do something. They wanted to do something legislatively, mm -hmm. you know, fix something. Uh, they weren't looking for headlines. And now I think too many of the people are looking for a headline. And they want to get their name in the paper, be on TV, as opposed to just making some tough decisions and doing things. Do you think... Um, some of where we find ourselves today is because maybe people are coming up younger in these positions and they don't have some type of experience or do you feel there's something else sat in there? I think a lot of, a lot of it's term limits. <clears throat> people, especially in California, are always looking for their next job. Okay. Uh, so they don't spend as much time on the current job. Uh, when I was in the legislature, we had a few people that had probably been there too long, but there's a natural turnover. You know, people generally don't stay in that spot forever, but you had people with real expertise in health or public safety or insurance or whatever. Now somebody's up there for a year or two, and they're a chairman of insurance, and they may know nothing about insurance. Right. Uh, and they're put on appropriations or budget, and they don't have any background in it. And you need to, you need to have some on-the-job uh, training, if right. you will, to mm -hmm. know how to do this stuff and some background in a particular area. And I think with the younger people, you're not you're not getting that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's young people. I think we need young people. Uh, but I look at two areas, both judiciary and legislative. You know, I want judges with experience, and I want legislators with experience. So that's going to mean they're going to be a little older. Yes. They're not going to be just out of college. Right. And we're losing that. The the ju average age of the judges is actually coming down, which I don't think is a good thing. I want somebody that's been up there that's got experience and mm -hmm. knows what's going on, and same way in the legislature. I think you're losing that. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a there's a trend to that? Because when I look around locally in Fullerton, let's yeah. say, you know, and being in Rotary, you hear a lot of 
folks uh, telling, well, you know, if only they did this or if only they did that. But they don't really want to deal with the world's new way of media or what have you. Do you feel that's why more people who are younger are more prone to looking for these positions and then the experienced folks are thinking, well, maybe I don't want to deal with the... Uh, the backlash of it all? Or? You know, I think social social media has not been good, particularly in politics. Yeah. You know, people are afraid to do something that may be controversial or maybe a bad de- not a bad decision, but a tough decision because uh, they know they're going to get beat up on social media. Uh, so, And what they don't realize, very few people make their <clears throat> political decisions on social media, but it gets, it gets headlines. Mm-hmm. They're going to see it. And I think they're afraid of making a really tough decision. And back when early early years of the legislature, people would do stuff. You know, some of it worked out, some of it didn't. But at least they wanted to make a decision. Now they want to. What did I see the big, <laughs> the big debate in Sacramento now is whether a 12-year-old kid should pay, play pop Warner football. We have water problems. We've got energy problems. We've got homeless problems. We've got all kinds of problems in California, and they're not they're not dealing with that. But they want to take care of pop Warner football. And so, you feel that's just because of the way that media's uh, shone across it more as a, an entertainment rather than maybe a way of life or state stability in our lives? I think it is, plus it gets headlines. Even even without social media, uh, I remember one of our guys had a spanking bill once, uh, which I didn't think was a good idea. We, we Republicans had control of the assembly for one year. And schools were only a problem. And one, one of our colleagues wanted to come up with a spanking bill. Spanking is outlawed in schools now. And he wanted to return spanking. And I said, that may be good in your household or something. But that's probably not a good bill idea because <laughs> we're really going to get beat up. And we got beat up on a lot, but it was, that was a bad idea. Uh, but I think people are afraid to tackle the big, the big issues and because it takes a lot of work. And it takes working working across the aisle to convince other people that this is a good idea, and you have to use a lot of political capital. And it's easier to do something like getting rid of pop winter football. Uh, so I think part of it's just the mindset, part of it's younger people, part of it's social media. Uh, but I think there we we haven't had the uh, type of leadership like a, a Reagan or somebody like that who can really bring people together. Uh, politics has tended to get more divisive and people get further apart as opposed to working together, even at local local level. Mm-hmm. Uh, and another part of it, people, <clears throat> the, the normal run-of-the-mill person is probably not as engaged as he should be. You know, everybody needs to be involved in politics because it imp- impacts everybody's life. And I think you're seeing that. There was an issue in New York where the... Uh, they closed the high school and sent all the kids home and put them on Zoom and put illegal aliens in the school. And even New York, which is very liberal, they went bananas. You know, that's not, that's not how we want to run our, our school system. So until it hits some of them personally, they may not want to get involved in politics. So there's a lot of, a lot of ramifications, but, uh, you know, I, had a, I, w- I was fortunate. I was there at a good time, worked with some good governors, had some good good times actually did did some things and i'm worried about getting things done now what sort of things are you worried about getting things done now just well like what do you want, which level you want state or federal <laughs> what, what, whichever you would like to share with us <clears throat> well the federal one i think is probably the worst uh it's more significant we've got significant foreign affairs issues with potential of war in various places in israel and ukraine and the red sea uh, we've got <clears throat> problems with homeless all over the place, yeah. and we've got problems with just budget. And I just reading the, the last time we had a balanced budget in the United States was when Clinton was president and Newt Gingrich was speaker. Oh, well, that was a while was in ago. The, in the nineties, and since then we've never had a balanced budget at the federal level, which is a problem. And we've gone trillions and trillions of dollars in debt, which we'll have to pay sometime. Right. The state level, they're not facing, you know, water issue, energy level, energy issues, uh, homeless issues, you know, housing and all that kind of thing. They spend more time on Pop Warner football. Uh, now, just out of interest, because, you know, I, I'm learning a lot about um, politics, too, being in this type of role that I'm in now, because generally in, in business, you don't really have to know too much about it. So on behalf of us all who don't know, would you mind sharing 
the importance of the budget there and how the we can't just keep printing money and what it de mm. what it happens to the yeah. country and us normal folks you can't you can't keep printing money yes we saw that during covid when they printed billions and billions of dollars and then we have a bit large inflation rates so and people can't afford to buy bread at the store even at the state level our budget uh, when i was when I was first in the assembly, I think our state budget was forty billion a year, and that was in '95. And now in 2024, it's going to be 300 billion as a state budget, uh, and most of that goes for welfare. Uh, roughly half of it, half of it goes to K through 12, uh, and not all that's being spent because our kids aren't learning to read and write and add. Uh, and a lot of it goes to welfare. And I agree we need to have a safety net, but more and more people, you know, we have the highest poverty rate in the entire United States. We've got more homeless people, more of that, and we need to we need to get off of that. One of the good things, I heard Newt Gingrich speak last week at a luncheon, and he reminded me <clears throat> that when Clinton was president, Clinton was a, a Democrat, but he was also pretty practical. He was reasonable. One of the biggest things they did was welfare reform. Mm because uh, we were just, and now we're back to where he was before then. You can't spend all that money on welfare. You need to spend money, you know, taking care of the people you've got here, you know, really educating people, having a good business climate. Uh, one of the biggest problems in California is just over-regulation for businesses. Mm -hmm. As you know, businesses are moving out of state Difficult. Mm -hmm. all the time. And one of the main reasons is just too much regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, the tax, we have the highest taxation rate. We have too much taxes, more than we should. Uh, but the regu regulatory stuff is just out of line, and the, at the federal level, there's too much regulation. So there are a lot of things that can be done, but a lot of the you know the, the legislators don't want to tackle that. They want to tackle something easy. And the big issues aren't easy. And what do you think? What can we do as regular folks uh, to um, make uh, you know uh, uh, government officials understand or talk to them about what sort of things should we be mentioning to see if things can change around or what things can be done well you do, you do a good job now with having regular <clears throat> regular meetings and forums with your local electeds uh i think it's important to meet meet with the state officials the federal officials and the local as often as you can and i think you have a good program for doing that and get get your individual business people to you know go one on one face to face with them so they actually the legislator or their staff can see somebody and see what the real issue is and that that's one of the biggest thing i think the chamber can do just keep that keep the relationship going cuz they'll they'll meet with you cuz you're an important chamber and then have your members out there so they can talk to them too tell them what what's going on why it's difficult to stay here and a lot of them, you know, a lot of them have moved out of state. You know, not even Orange County has been impacted by that. Uh, so I think it's important to have that relationship and that contact between your members and the legislators. So you mentioned a lot of things there which we all need to take note. And luckily, on the 26th of this month, we actually have a government affairs uh, cocktail evening here at the chamber, which is where a lot of our government officials are going to be at. And we, we're encouraging our members to be there and talk about these things you, you were mentioning. But on a positive note, because there's always a positive ta side to it, what do you see that is a change from when it was when you're on the Senate floor that is more in a, in a good way? I think... I think Ultimately, more people are getting engaged. I mean, most people mm. want to run their life, run their business without government. They don't want to have to worry about who's in office. It's only when government starts to overreach or intrude that they get, in, get engaged, and sometimes it takes a lot. And I think because of a lot of the educational issues that are coming up now, the school issues, the homeless issues, people are getting engaged because mm -hmm. it's impacting them. Like I say, the average person shouldn't have to get involved in government. They should, right. You should be able to do your business, run your life, and not worry about it. Uh, but sometimes when, when the worries or the challenges come up, people do get do get engaged, and I'm seeing a lot more of that. I mean, you see it, you saw it in that little Iowa caucus where 100,000 people went out and five degree weather yeah. so they could they could express their view for a candidate uh, so i think people are getting engaged more uh, and while i like to bash social media sometimes social media raises some of these issues awareness and people, right. and people says i have to i want to express my opinion mm -hmm. and i want to do it and i think the ability to contact your legislators like i say you're in a good position 
chamber's a responsible outfit. You ask legislators to come, they'll come, and your members can talk to them, mm-hmm. and they should take advantage of that and, and say what you know what they what they want to say. Uh, so I think people are becoming more engaged, uh, which is good. You need you know we do live in a democracy, and the people that vote win. Uh, so if you want to do something, you need to get more votes than the other side. So the fact that we're getting people out and even the, the last two presidential elections, I think both of them set records for total number of votes. Uh, the first one with Trump and the second one with Biden, I thought they might fall off, but there are actually more people to come out, and I'm guessing this next election is probably going to get more, right. which is good. Yeah. I mean, you, people have to get engaged. When our forefathers came up with this idea, and I, I'm always amazed— how smart those guys were. I know, uh, isn't cause, it crazy? Cause that they drew when up you a read constitution the... from nothing. I mean, they had a good base from England, but to do what they did uh, was amazing. And they basically said, you know, the people are going to decide, and they wanted a stronger state government than a federal government because they wanted local local control, yeah. which gets back to a chamber. So it all starts locally, and they want they want people to get engaged and express their opinions. So I think that's a positive thing. That we're, we're now doing what our founding fathers said we should do more of. How much of that do you think plays a part in still in today's political arena? I think a lot, uh, because a lot of a lot of the big debates now at the Supreme Court level are whether or not we should interpret the Constitution as it was written, or whether we should modify it to bring it up to quote current standards, whatever we are. And for the most part, the Supreme Court has said, no, we think the Founding Fathers had a good idea and we're going to stick with it, uh, which I think is good. You can't have a document that changes every generation. Right. You want to have your your basic doc- documents have some level of relevance continuously, and, and it, it has. But it gets, gets back to the work those folks put into it, putting it together and putting the banking system and all this stuff. It was really amazing. It's like starting a new world from scratch, and they did it, and they did did a pretty good job, in my it, opinion. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I really do. Um, so moving out on now, because we've touched a lot on politics, and so what happens when you you sort of retire as a senator? I mean, what, what happens <laughs> to your world then? I mean, it's been your whole world, and then suddenly it closes. What what happens? Uh, well, it, it did shut it. Your, your phone your phone. Uh, Frequency drops down a lot because you were, when you're in the legislature, especially the leader, you were on call 24 7. Right. You didn't control your life. The governor or the legislature could say, okay, we need you back here tomorrow or today. Mm-hmm. Uh, so after you get out of that, your life sort of gets back to normal. Like when I was practicing law, you control your schedule. Uh, then I got involved in government relations. I worked for a couple of law firms as basically not really a lobbyist, but just advising them how to get through government wickets and advise clients, public and private clients, <clears throat> how to deal with government at various levels. And it helps if you've been in it uh, in talking to people, telling people how to get through it. Uh, so I'm still doing this. I'm probably working about half time now, uh, but I still enjoy it. I'm still working do, working on a couple of people's campaigns, helping them out. Oh, wow. Uh, so I still stay involved, still now we get to play with the grandkids as opposed to kids. Right, right. Uh, do traveling. That's great. You just <laughs> feed them candy and hand yeah, them back. That's right. Much much better than having your own kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. So, so uh, another part of, of one of the things, you've been on many committees and, and various uh, boards and, and directorships. What type of uh, advice or, or information would you be able to share with because I have a board. There's plenty of nonprofits that have a board. What type of advice would you give to board members, even uh, in business today? Uh, I'd say definitely be engaged. Uh, I think being involved in the chamber is very important. I was also in the Rotary, <coughs> Rotary Club since the 70s. I think service clubs are very important. Mm. And they provide a very big role, both you know just locally and on a broader scale. Uh, but just getting engaged. Uh, I was also involved in other other groups and association. I was in the Elks, still am in the Elks Club, still in the Fullerton Yacht Club. I'm the Commodore of the Fullerton Yacht Club, very <laughs> prestigious club, because uh, we have a lot of water in Fullerton. Uh, but just stay, stay, yeah, <laughs> just staying staying engaged. And everybody has their own uh, group. I was active in soccer when my kids were in soccer. Uh, so I'll tell you, tell you one story that was sort of funny. Nothing to do with your question. And when I was there, soccer was very new. I hadn't planned to be a soccer coach. Mm. 
uh, but they didn't have enough coaches, and they had a lot of kids that wanted to play. So I got I got recruited because be one of the parents had to be a coach. So I knew nothing about soccer. So I read read two books in the library. I learned about soccer. So I started doing it. And also then you had to ref the games because we didn't have any referees. Now mm. they have paid high school kids to do it, which is very good. So I remember I was refing one game when I was in the council, and I called some, made some call, and one of the ladies uh, in the audience said, well, I hope he doesn't run the city like he refs football or soccer games. And I turned over and I said, I do. <laughs> but anyway, it's like just, just getting engaged. Everybody's got a network through youth sports or churches. We were very active in St. Juliana's uh, church. Uh, so just developing various friendships. Uh, just The more people get together and work together, it really solves a lot of problems. Mm. A lot of people now don't want to listen to somebody else's view. I said, you should listen to everybody's view, whether you agree or not, because okay, sometimes they may have a good idea. Yeah, uh, stems from and, something else, yeah. And I really, liked, I really liked being on the city council more than the state legislature, mm. uh, because you could actually talk to people and you could have debates. There were very... What, what you see on the TV is really not what happens in the legislature. There's very few heavy-duty debates on stuff. A lot of the stuff is just uh, ramrodded through or party party line vote. Uh, with the city council, you could actually talk to people because you saw them. You saw them regularly, and you could have discussions. And uh, most most of the decisions when I council were were unanimous. You know, even though we had we had Democrats and Republicans, but most of the stuff, you know, was just common sense things. Uh, but you have to have a relationship with the people and get to know them, you know, go to church with them, have a beer, go to the picnic, see with their kids and all that. Uh, so I think it's very important having those kind of relationships at the local level. So, Dick, you uh, you touched on a, a f- amazing amount of points there, and one of them was uh, obviously being part of the community and clubs and things like that. And you mentioned uh, you, you've been in Rotary since uh, the 70s, I believe yeah. you said. So... Um, and you briefly mentioned, which is, uh, I haven't been in Fullerton too long, only a few years, but I've heard lots of things about the Yacht Club and how you're the Commodore of the Yacht Club. So would you like to share a little bit about this secret squirrel club that's going around there? Yeah, it's not, not too secret. But, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, the Fullerton Yacht Club, I think I started in the 80s, or I think when Brett was born. Uh a, my off my law office is within within the Hunt Wesson building. And I was good friends with one of the Hunt Wesson guys, and they did a promotion once on the Fullerton Yacht Club. In fact, the logo we have on our little membership thing, I stole from Hunt Wesson. Don't tell them. Uh, but they did a little promo just on the Fullerton Yacht Club for some product, but then they did they dropped it. Uh, so we did our our birth announcement for Brett. Uh, from the Fullerton Yacht Club it was a Commodore and Mrs. Ackerman, and we talked about running lights and enclosed head and all this stuff, and his, what his beam was and his bow and all that. Uh, so then I just started up this club. A number number of us had boats, uh, but not you know not most not most of them. Now we we probably have 100 110 members and maybe wow. 10 people have boats. Uh-huh. Uh, and we meet. We have two meetings a, a year. One a Christmas party. And one in Catalina, mm-hmm. and the only reason on the Commodore because I used to pay for all the booze at all the parties to begin. This, this has been going <laughs> it's on an for job. thirty years, so it's easy easy to win if you buy everybody the booze. Right, uh, it was just a bunch bunch of people in Fullerton. Like I say, most of them don't have boats, but they just like to get together and have a good time. We do we do go to one trip to Catalina where people you have to have a boat, but you don't have to. You can go on somebody else's boat. And we used to have ten or twelve boats going over there, and now we have maybe three or four. But we still, we still do it. In fact, we, I used to go on the Ensenada race from uh, Newport to Ensenada. Oh, really? And I went on that once, and there was no wind, so we turned around and went to Catalina. Right. And that was the start of the Ensenada alternative. So oh. the same weekend as the Ensenada race, you guys we go, we to, go to Catalina. Catalina. Right. Yeah. Well, hey, Dick, thank you very much for coming in today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your time and your service to our community, yes. which is more important. And I've really enjoyed today and learning a lot more about you. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right thank you very you. much. <laughs>